For this final lecture, we, I want to return to the South and how uh, in the generation after Reconstruction, uh, a new social, political, and racial system came into being. The system that we call in a shorthand, for want of a better term, Jim Crow. Um, we'll talk of in a minute what this involves, but which lasted until destroyed by the civil rights revolution of the 1960s. So it lasted a long time. And that movement, as we have said before, was often called the Second Reconstruction. Now, last week in the Janap book, we had this speech by Frederick Douglass from 1880 in which he offered a critique of Reconstruction policies as what he called radically defective, that freedom had been achieved, citizenship had been achieved, but the former slaves, as we all know, were not granted access to land and no real protection against violence, intimidation, etc. Four years before that, Douglas had given a very courageous speech, actually, at the Republican National Convention, the Republican Convention of 1876, which nominated Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, Douglas challenged the delegates, again, to think about what had and had not been done in Reconstruction. He said, you say you have emancipated us. You have, and I thank you for it. You say you have enfranchised us, and I thank you for that. But what is your emancipation? What is your enfranchisement? Enfranchisement, the right to vote. What does it amount to if the black man, after having been made free by the letter of your law, is unable to exercise that freedom? And after having been freed from the slaveholder's lash, he is to be subject to the slaveholder's shotgun. The question now is, do you mean to make good to us the promises in the Constitution? the promises in the Constitution. This question would reverberate for many decades, and in fact, we are still debating today in some ways what these promises in the Constitution actually mean. So in the most basic sense, as Douglas was forced to say, Reconstruction failed. It did not permanently guarantee the basic rights of the former slaves. Writing in the 1930s, uh, W.B. Du Bois in Black Reconstruction in America used the interesting phrase, a splendid failure. He said Reconstruction was a failure, but it was a splendid failure. Why splendid? He said it failed, but not for the reason most white people expected it to fail. That is, the incapacity of the former slaves. It actually demonstrated, he said, their capacity for freedom, for citizenship, for participation in democracy, things widely denied in 1865 and in fact still denied when Du Bois was writing in the 1930s. Reconstruction also laid the groundwork for future struggles against this new race system. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the sleeping giants, um, as Charles Sumner called them, in the Constitution. Reconstruction, even if it failed, foreclosed even more oppressive, uh, an even more oppressive system, what Southern governments actually put into effect or tried to put to, uh, into effect immediately after the Civil War when given a free hand by uh, Andrew Johnson. The resurrection, basically, of involuntary servitude with gang labor and virtually no legal rights at all for the former slaves. The overthrow of Johnson's Reconstruction Plan f eliminated that option after the Civil War. And Reconstruction created the space for the emergence of institutions, particularly educational institutions and the church, that would be the springboard for future struggle long in the future. If you think of the Civil Rights Revolution, of the 1960s, it came out of the black church and it came out of the black colleges, the sit-ins and SNCC and things like that. So people often ask, was the failure of Reconstruction inevitable? Let's go back to the very beginning of the course where we try to talk about whether the Civil War was inevitable. 
And I said then, everything is inevitable or seems to be inevitable after it happens. In other words, it's very hard to imagine other scenarios than what actually happened in a plausible way. Certainly the obstacles to the success of Reconstruction were immense, and not only in the United States. In every society in the Western Hemisphere, slavery was, that when it was abolished, was followed by some form, some system of racial inequality, except perhaps in Haiti, where the white population basically all fled. And in all those societies, as agricultural regions, they fell into a long, long history of economic dependency. In the late 19th century, it was almost impossible for agricultural regions to develop themselves economically, and that was true of the American South as well as most other places that abolished slavery in the Western Hemisphere. Or we could simply say with Senator Howe, Timothy Howe of Wisconsin, who I quoted a few weeks ago, we have cast our anchor 100 years uh, into the future. In other words, this was 100 years too soon. I mean, that's what the history shows. It took 100 years to get back for the nation to the agenda of Reconstruction. But one can also imagine other scenarios, if you want, not a utopia, but the federal government making it clear, the, making clear the intention to enforce the law, to enforce the Constitution. One might imagine the basic rights of the former slaves eventually being accepted in the South, a two-party system becoming entrenched, as in the rest of the country, and the South moving toward integration into the rest of the country rather than remaining a region apart as it did for so long after the end of Reconstruction. But this is all just speculation, of course. I mean, we like to do that, historians. Nothing wrong with it. But we do know that the overthrow of Reconstruction was a disaster for African Americans and indeed for American society as a whole and that the consequences lasted long into the 20th century and in some ways are still written into our institutions and politics as I have tried to show.